Bem, uh, bom dia a todos. Eu acho que posso fazer a introdução em português, porque a professora Marion fala muito bem português, né? embora que ela prefira fazer a palestra em inglês. né? Ah, então, é um... inicialmente, eu tenho que fazer alguns avisos. Então, vou começar com isso. Ah, inicialmente, informando que estamos ao vivo. Né? Ao vivo na internet, pelo Facebook. né? Não, não está Face. É no site do IEA. Né? Então, é, aqui tem o endereço, né, que é www.iea.usp.br uh, barra ao vivo. Né? Então, aí podem encaminhar para seus amigos, né, quem quiser acompanhar a nossa conversa e a, a palestra da, da professora ao vivo. Né? Uh, os informando para depois da apresentação da professora, que as perguntas deverão ser feitas ao microfone e a pessoa deverá se identificar, especialmente também por nossas, esperamos, muito, muito, muitos ouvintes uh, que vão nos acompanhando via, via site. E a gente peça de vocês colocarem seus celulares no modo silencioso, por favor. A... Uh, <risos> pois é. <risos> Será que o meu tá? <risos> Sem problemas. Então, tem esse tempo ainda para acertar esses pequenos detalhes técnicos. Ah, ao público online, que não sei se já tem alguém lá nos acompanhando, né? ah, vocês podem fazer perguntas e que podem ser enviados para iearesponde.usp.br Certo. Ah, e, finalmente, os vídeos, o vídeo e as fotos estarão disponíveis na mediateca do IEA dentro de 10 dias corridos. Né? Também ah, a mediateca disponível no site do IEA. Muito bem. Ah, muito obrigado. Então, eu vou... Primeiramente, agradecer a presença da, da professora Marion aqui nesse conjunto de palestras que temos aqui no IEA, no Instituto de Estudos Avançados. Uh, inicialmente, a princípio, vocês devem ter esperado aqui o professor Pedro Jacobi, que era anunciado para moderar este, uh, esta conversa, né, ou esta palestra com... Uh, posto eu conversa, mas o professor Pedro, uh, infelizmente ou não infelizmente, ele tá, uh, foi convidado pela FAPESP para participar do evento em Nova York, então ele deu preferência a este evento. né? Então, uh, por isso vocês têm que se contentar com minha presença aqui nesta mesa. Uh, então, agora estou procurando o... Espera uh, aí. Não, agora não estou preparado, mas tá, já daqui a pouquinho eu vou encontrar o... Uh, uh, as informações sobre a nossa convidada de hoje. Bem, desculpem pela demora, agora uh, encontrei então as informações da professora Marion Glaser. Uh, aí eu vou fazer a apresentação em inglês já, uh, uma vez que eu recebi também uh, a apresentação em inglês. Né? Então, uh, uh, Marion Glaser, she is currently uh, leading the Social Ecological Systems Analysis Group uh, and, uh, at CMT, and she is all, also giving lectures at the University of Bremen in Germany. She is vice president of the German Society for Human Ecology and a SSC member and vice chair of Integrated Marine Biosphere, EMBAR. Her qualifications, she is or has uh, Yes, I, I think maybe it's the, the, the basic uh, qualification in economics and political science at the University of Cologne and the London School of Economics and Political Science. 
She, ha she holds a Master in Development Studies from the Bath University and also from Bath uh, in, in Rural Sociology. Uh, that is the doctoral thesis, the PhD. Then she has, he did her, her first habilitation, that's something like our Livre Docencia, uh, in Agrarian Sociology at the Humboldt University Berlin and uh, at the University of Bremen, a second habilitation in geography. Her main work experiences is related to development cooperation and research on self-help housing, agriculture and irrigation management, forestry flood control and coastal management in Colombia, Bangladesh and Belize, Bra Brazilian German mangrove dynamics and management projects. And finally, uh, that's from 96 to 2005, and uh, uh, another project that she is involved or is governance and management of coastal social ecological systems project in Indonesia. Indonesia. And currently she is on a month, one month work travel in north, northeast and, well, southeast of Brazil. So uh, we are very happy having you here uh, in the in this wonderful place here, as you already mentioned here at the EAR. Um, uh, maybe you give some additional information about your work, definitely, certainly, and I hope it, uh, and I'm very sure that we will have a very interesting talk now, and then afterwards we have an, an not uh, also a very interesting discussion. So please, Professor Marion. Bom dia a todos, agradeço que posso estar presente aqui e eu poderia na minha fala aceitar perguntas em português, mas não me atrevi a fazer tudo em português, e também como inglesa, idioma de comunicação internacional, vou fazer em inglês. Um, bom, um, yes, so I, I'll change to English and just to let you know what I'll do. I will talk about, just briefly, about ZMT, the Center for Marine Tropical Research, my institute, and opportunities there. And then I will go over to the theme of my talk, systems, networks, and people, social energy for more sustainable human nature relations, um, with case examples from my research in Belize, Central America, in Brazil, North Brazil, Pará, and in Indonesia, just illustrating some examples. And then I'll come to some conclusions and ideas for few further work. So ZMT, Center for Marine Tropical Research, we were founded in 1991 and we're concerned with capacity building, knowledge building, surrounding sustainable use and human nature relations in the coastal and marine realm. So that's just some background, you don't need all of that. Um, here are some of the projects we have. We have currently 76 projects in 30 countries worldwide and we have several memoranda of un understanding with universities in Brazil also and almost 800 alumni people who have studied with ZMT worldwide today. Um, that's how we grew. And when I entered ZMT here, there were not very many. Six before I came, 12 after I came today, here we have about, at the end, about 270 staff in the institute. Um, uh, okay, I already said our research is concerned with tropical, coastal and marine ecosystems and integrated management. Um, so there are some key words of what we work with, um, some of the key issues in the coastal zone as we've seen it that you can look at. I don't need to sort of read them all out just to give you an impression. Um, the key theme is the interactions and the co-development of society and ecosystem. So we aim for interdisciplinary and integrated work. And of course, internationally, since we work with partner countries across the global tropical belt. 
Here are some projects, and you can see we have projects in Brazil. SAW has um, um, a lot of Brazilian partners to do with mangrove work and a number of others. There is a network on ocean governance that relates very much to uh, USP work as well. And there's some examples. Here is our structure where you can see, um, well, the red one is the research group I lead. We have 20 research groups. Each group has between 10 and 20 members. And I lead the social ecological systems analysis group in the social sciences department here. Um, so we have three groups in that, and that's quite unique to have a social science department in a natural science-founded institute. Um, junior research groups, so led by postdocs, we have a number. These are just some examples uh, with the thema themes. Uh, these are our current junior research groups. Um, and it might be interesting to some of us, we have a master's program that is funded with um, BOLSAS, with studentships, and there are some leaflets on that there for anybody or you might want to pass that on. Um, yeah. Also, it's possible to visit our institutes via visiting fellowships, and that's a selection of people who have very recently visited for a few months at a time. Um, Okay, we have a diving center, scientific diving, and quite importantly also for the topic we have here, we have something called the Office for Knowledge Exchange, which is a team that is concerned specifically with translating scientific results for societal partners um, in industry, in administration, and also ecosystem users in community. So we have a scientist assistance in doing that, which is very helpful, Office for Knowledge Exchange. Okay, and just as the final one, that's our um, recent composition of PhD students. So you can see 62% are not from Germany. It's very international from sort of the tropical belt. That's, um, I think, a year ago or so, the composition of PhDs. Okay, social science department, where my work group is, the social ecological systems group, uh, one of the three work groups we have. Um, and our group is concerned with social ecological dynamics, system dynamics and their governance. We are very interested in developing methods for assessing the, co the co-evolutionary dynamics of social ecological systems. So uh, we've uh, concentrated on agent-based modeling, on network analysis uh, recently, and uh, on participatory collaborative forms of knowledge generation. Um, and also our focus is on assessing drivers at multiple, from multiple levels, uh, from the global to the local having as a focus region, subnational regions. And my case studies will be three subnational regions that I've worked in. Um, here are some key questions that our group asks. Under which conditions can coastal and marine social ecological systems, CMSES, adapt and transform towards sustainable outcomes? How do natural and social agents interact in that context? Under which conditions do innovations arise? And under which conditions do they arise in um, non-polarizing forms that are pro-poor, if you want to call it that? And what obstructs uh, system transformation? What are the leverage arenas, the points where you can interfere policy regulations with maximum desirable impact? Um, here are the places that I have worked and our group have worked across the belt. It's just a smaller version of what you've seen before, but you can see Brazil and Indonesia are long-term focus with projects for in Brazil now since 1995, so a long time, and Indonesia also for the past 12 years. But also my PhD is from Bangladesh, so I have worked there a long time. Um, current work we have you can see there in Brazil and Bangladesh and also in the South Pacific ongoing projects, but that's just background. So the first bit um, is over. ZMT, uh, our institute, our work group, that's the first introductory bit of my talk, so cut. <laughs> um, 
I don't. Um, so I'm now talk, starting to talk on. Well, we have a working definition for social ecological systems. I just wanted to run that past you, so you know what I'm talking about, because there are many work de definitions of social ecological systems. Um, my last count was about 12, and they all have their pros and cons, and all of them are useful in particular contexts. So our working definition builds on um, a Stockholm definition from the Resilience Center, but it alters it in some points. So we concentrate on a biogeophysical space. In our case, that's the coastal region, a subnational region, a mangrove peninsula, a coral reef archipelago that is part, usually part of a country. It can overlap, but it's a, a, a biogeophysical space. And then we focus on these regions in terms of a particular issue or problem, and we analyze the dynamics surrounding that problem, focusing on associated actors and institutions, that's social actors and institutions. So if you have this, um, this kind of um, graph that you might recognize from Stockholm, you have the social side, a local ecosystem, and then wider bioregion, bioregion. And here you have the social system with local management, institutions and settings from the local to the global. Um, so we apply that, uh, no, that way. We apply that to one of the case examples that I will bring later, the Kaiti Mangrove Peninsula here. That's a mangrove peninsula in North Para. We'll come back to that. We have the problem of ecosystem conservation, mangrove uh, deforestation, desmatamento. Um, and we have a number of institutions and actors that are associated with this. Local extractivists, farmers, residents in mangrove adjacent villages. We have institutions and associations here at the region and at the national level, we have some international donors. And it's the interactions between those and the ecosystem here, our focal level, that we study. So just a sort of basic framework that we have applied in many um, cases. Um, now, social energy. That's something, I don't know, there's one missing. That's it. This one is the one I wanted. Because my topic is social energy for sustainable human nature relations. Now, why study social energy and what is it even? Um, it's something that has occurred in the literature. I come back to it, but I started to study it because it seemed to be a topic that linked my now several decades of work in various countries. And I started to study just um, different literatures to see where does it appear. And it appears in system theory. Um, the Haken here is a, actually a physicist, but he studied different systems, called it a collective desire to leave the old state. It has to do with system imminent self-organizing forces, with collective efforts that support the self-organization to meet new challenges. It appears in sociology to do with the perseverance of individual and collective actors in the pursuit of a common goal. Sustainability studies have it um, and state that uh, change dynamics towards the common good needs social energy to prevail over the longer term. The kind of the project cannot end when the funding ends. You find it in development collaboration as well. And we have it in economics somewhat more ambiguously, the invisible hand, the way markets and prices resolve things. That is also a form of social energy that cannot be discarded. My own encounters with social energy in Colombia, in Vazonis, in Bogota, of uh, the very poorest in uh, land invasions to just have uh, housing, agrarian change in Bangladesh, the self-organization of rural people to collaboratively use new irrigation technologies to not leave them to the big capital owners, but to form uh, shamitis, that was self-help groups, to collectively acquire wells and use them collectively. Um, another counter. Um, 
Belize, Central America, a very small country that used to be a British colony, 200,000 people, tiny. Sustainable rainforest management there, I was part of co-initiating the first community managed and uh, organized national park in Belize to um, avoid rainforest deforestation. In the Rizex in Brazil, you know about Rizex and uh, our 10-year work in the north of Brazil accompanied the initiation of a coastal resex there, and I'll talk about that. And informal fishery regulation around islands in Indonesia. We had a very interesting, have a very interesting example of self-organization there. So key questions I will ask through the three case studies that I come to are, what are the systemic sources of social energy for sustainability, what generates it, and is a crisis needed to activate social energy for sustainable outcomes, or are there other kind of possible ways to start it? Um, how does it develop over time? Um, what are relevant system features or processes that determine whether social energy forms or is destroyed? And uh, what type of social networks promote it in particular? And the last and always really important question, what are appropriate forms of governance that support and maintain desirable social energy over time? And I must say here, there is social energy that is not desirable. One of the really important drivers of the mafia is uh, social energy. So we are talking about desirable forms, uh, social energy for desirable human nature relations, for human well-being, those sort of things. Um, so I will examine three cases, rainforest management in Belize, mangrove management in Brazil, and reef fisheries management in Indonesia, and try and draw some lessons from that. Um, Belize, as I said, Central America, 200,000 people. It takes you an hour to drive east-west and five hours to drive north-south. If you want to be discreet, you have to leave the country. But that's just an experience from a, a four-year project that um, we lived there for four years. Forest plan planning and management project, a British development cooperation project that I was um, a social science lead in. Um, manage, rainforest management in Belize, the problem that we had there, a growing population that was partly working on plantations, but also partly doing slash and burn agriculture, deforesting. They needed to supplement their incomes from plantations or their survival entirely through burning the forest and doing milpa, which is the kind of mixed agriculture. So when we started there, this is the kind of statement we got in community meeting. We need to kill the bush to survive, leave us alone. And the bush was a very diverse and rich rainforest, which was rapidly deforesting, as you saw with that photo. Um, so that's the image on the left that you were increasingly getting, the deforestation. On the right, we have the sign for the Five Blues Lake National Park, which was something a local forest community founded and is to this day managing, and this is 25 years later. And I sort of regularly research it in the internet, and next year a master student is going there to look at dynamics. So from uncontrolled slash and burn to the first long-term community-managed national park in Belize. It's one of, I think, quite rare examples of something like that. This is just uh, something I copied from the internet. Uh, I looked recently as well to see whether they're still there. Um, so they are there um, 25 or more years after. <clears throat> so how did this happen? And why did it happen? And what are we finding about social energy? Here I have some of the sources that you can see. There's this park had a lagoon that was quite deep, and people there were able to link to divers in the Keys in front of Belize. Belize has quite a large tourism influx for diving because they have coral reef keys um, and uh, holiday makers there. So they came in 
crafts tradition that could be marketed, nature trail, animal watching, traditional foods, so relevant local resources and access to international market was given. But of course you have that in many places. So what else? Um, this is uh, uh, the team that was working from the forest department of the project I was working in, locally rooted but well-networked support. So there was support in the ministries to look at laws and regulations um, that, could, that were actually altered in order to support this national park initiative. Um, what there also was, um, probably more rare, were two residents in this really um, not very well developed community. There was no electricity when we went there. But these two leaders in the front, they were of United States origins. They had lived there for 20 years, but they still had connections in the US. So they were able to connect to schools in the US and develop a school program for final years to do social projects for this national park. Out of this developed an ecotourism eco backpacking program for local communities and a social final year program for the schools in the states that were associated. And that was possible because there were two leaders who were linking both ways. Um, yeah, long-term experience of eye-level collaboration against adversity, maybe that's a little too internal with the projects and the kind of uh, difficulty of developing this lagoon. These are just some pictures from the early um, phase of it. But what we did have was leaders, um, and this is questions about the dynamics of this social energy. There was strong social energy for this national park. People were not l no longer saying we need to kill the bush, but we need to protect the bush because it's so highly valuable to these visitors that are coming and helping us to develop us and helping us to appreciate what we have here. So there were leaders in their middle age, in the 80s. And my question now is, how is that leadership being replaced? These leaders from 1980s will no longer be there. And a student is going this year to see how all that has developed. And um, a very central question would be, is this national park still a central income source for local people as it was? And if not, how have the dynamics around that developed? Um, so, but to conclude with this case example, I think what I've shown you here is a successfully supported local social energy for conservation, very much over the long term. And I want to try and learn from that. And as I said, the student is about to go there, so there'll be much more information later. What I can say now is that you had a small, well-connected management group with capable leaders. You had access to a backpacker ecotourism market through the schools, but for local communities that were earning next to nothing, this was tourism, which brought more money than slash and burn, milpa. And uh, you had external support, the schools and the local ex-US American leaders formed an NGO. The local benefits for the community were directly dependent on protecting the forest. They could no longer slash and burn and also realize the national park, so they turned against it. And that's not the case with all alternative incomes. The locals who bore the cost of nature conservation also got the benefits through house, in-house tourism, Maya, food, all sorts of things they did there. Um, a supportive government authority that also helped them when they were really threatened from the outside, which happened by local fazenderos and some external technical assistance from us in institutional development and so on. So that's our case study from Belize. If you have any questions on that one in particular, I can answer them now. Otherwise, I would go on and speak about the second case study, which takes you to Brazil. <clears throat> I think I need a little bit of water, sorry. Just have a look at the screen. So our second case study, um, Pará, um, and the mangrove dynamics and management project was a 10-year research collaboration between the CMPK, 
UK and um, the German equivalent ministry with over 100 researchers. Um, that is long finished now. Um, one of the, and we concentrated, I have to go back to that, we concentrated on this peninsula here. That's the mangrove peninsula of 150 square kilometers with about 21 communities, all these dots on here, that use that mangrove area. Um, and so that's the social ecological system. The mangrove area dynamics were to be examined, but there were problems of um, deforestation, of um, fishing techniques that weren't legal. So this is um, one of the early outcomes of our research. You have here percentage of rural households in those 21 villages, and you have here the products of the mangrove that people were using. So you can see a lot of products, a great diversity of use. Um, and the black one, the black columns are commercial use, the white columns are subsistence use, so use in the house for eating, for exchanging. So you can see a very diverse picture and um, quite a lot of poverty alleviation function of that mangrove. We have a book in Portuguese on that and also one in English. Um, on the social ecological connections, what we found were some vicious circles, and I'm outlining the problem now that we come to the solution. Um, a vicious cycle between no social rights of mangrove producers, dependence on patrons, and lower prices that were th therefore realized by um, um, tiradores de caranguejo, crab collectors, pescadores, so that the only way they could survive was to fish more, to get more, more caranguejos, more crabs, and to self-exploit, so that both the mangrove as an ecosystem and also the produ producers were suffering. Um, cases where people went ill into the mangroves, um, even died because there was no, um, what's it called, seguro de saúde and no, uh, so no social rights at all. So you had a vicious circle of over-exploitation of the producer and the mangrove ecosystem. Um, an associated vicious circle, cycle was child labor, trabajo infantil, children not going to school, um, more illiteracy, fewer income options, more mangrove dependence, so that people ended up working in the mangroves across the generation, even though nobody wanted that. We had one student who tried throughout years, always interviewed mangrove producers, whether they wanted their children to also enter the profession. Nobody wanted it, but a huge percentage did because of the lack of options. So all of this um, ended up um, making poverty uh, worse. I hope this is... Yeah. Um, to look at some of the laws behind that. And uh, you had sustainability problems with mangrove deforestation. And um, all of the use of mangroves, fl uh, flora, mangrove plants, was actually illegal. But in reality, what you had was very intensive use. You had large-scale commercial uses. Oh, I hate this here. <laughs> large-scale commercial uses uh, of outsiders that were unsustainable and predatory, and you also had subsistence small-scale uses here by locals that were much more sustainability-oriented for fences, for fish traps, for cooking, for making charcoal, just for the villages um, that are by the mangroves. Now, that's where social energy comes from, and that's why my argument on social energy is here. What actually was happening um, was that the social energy for protecting the mangroves was being wasted because it was among local actors who needed some mangrove use themselves that was illegal and they were criminalized. And for that reason, their efforts to protect themselves against the outsiders were not supported. Everything was illegal. Um, now, that issue was um, had, I won't go into all the details, but it actually led to a lot more mangrove wastage than necessary and to 
worse social conditions than they needed to be among the producers. There's a paper published on that, if you're interested. The basic conclusion was that um, illegality of total prohibition of mangrove use led to more deforestation and more poverty. Now, in come the solution, which is, I'm painting very black and white here, but at the time this really did appear um, as a solution. Okay, here are still some examples of um, the, uh, the unsustainable dynamics that were ongoing at the time. Um, you had uh, violent conflicts between outsiders and local people who wanted to defend their forest. That's a sign of the social energy. You had um, local initiatives for conservation and sustainable use of forests, like wanting firewood lots, wanting replanting that couldn't be implemented because people weren't supposed to be using the mangrove at all. So this legal ban was totally against local social energy. It didn't work with it as it could have done. But uh, what then happened, this was um, at the beginning of the, uh, the, the period of um, the, the new constitutions, and the resects were a possible option. The resects which had their origin in um, a previous period of failed centralized planning, and um, it was a very supportive political climate. This is a picture from Carnival du Belen, and so that was the atmosphere. Um, the leaders at the time were very much the heroes, and making a resex on the coast was an officially supported institutional solution. So since um, the year 2000, it was possible to do resex under the constitution on the coast, and this resex, Kaite Taparasu, was officially implemented uh, from 2005. We accompanied five years of initiation, making the local rules and the process of going to the federal level, to IBAMA, to actually make this RISEX a legal entity. So at the time, and this is now some time ago, the RISEX did develop into a channel for this local social energy, for local conservation. And uh, um, these are just some examples of that. Uh, local RISEX was formed. Um, local communities associated into polos and then municipal and cross-municipal activities. And these are the kind of examples of um, the ongoings at the time. Environmental education, community radios in communities without electricity, beekeeping, that's um, apicultura in, in communities um, mangrove adjacent. So it was beekeeping in the mangroves. And planning of resource management. And we have quite a lot written on that period. And um, very much in contrast to what's happening today in that region, it was a successful locally supported development of managing regional resources, mangrove resources. Um, yes. And here's some of my analysis of why that worked at the time. For one, you had a clear reference territory. The mangrove peninsula was what people were talking about, and these blue communities and this socioeconomic impact area were the ones that were managing it and making the rules. So that's um, quite a good sort of condition. Eleanor Ostrom talks about that. You had a local right to exclude outsiders. It was a little bit ambiguous, but people implemented and understood it as that. So local uh, crab extractivists, Giradores de Carangueju, had uh, could implement their local ideas on how to manage the, the, the crabs, and this was implemented up to Ibama level. Um, so to cut a long story very short, this is our analysis of why in 2004, just because before the implementation, this thing worked. You had a conservation authority with a set of rights and duties, and you had the ecosystem users, the local fishers and crab collectors, with another set of rights and duties. And they considered this balanced and legitimate. The conservation authority, CMPT, Conseil Nacional de 
populações tradicionais, what today is in Bio and Ibama, they delegated implementation and monitoring to users. That's a right, they didn't have to do the work. And they assumed the duty of legalizing local rules and giving some training. So for them, that was an okay balance. The ecosystem users, local mangrove villagers, the members of the RISEX, they gained the right to develop their own management rules. And they wanted to do that, and they did that effectively and communicated, supported by um, the, the RISEX team and our research team. And they gained the duty to implement and monitor, which was better than having fights in the night with invading loggers like they had before in the mangrove ter territories. So that sort of worked. And it had its weaknesses, we've published on that, but it was something where we expected that now local social energy is channeled towards actually achieving something positive. And then sort of, um, we weren't funded any longer, 10 years passed, only a few students here and there, my main work was in Indonesia. In 2015, I came back and we did a big workshop with 40 communities, on how has it been and how has the RISEX worked and so on. And so we are now to 2016. And the balance between these things had shifted. Um, a per, n the local rules had been superseded by new top-down rules that people were finding out from the radio without ever having been involved in them. So the old leaders of the RISEX said, well, I now listen to the radio, I find out I can't do this, and the next thing I know is somebody finds me for breaking a rule I haven't been part of. So this um, local rulemaking had been superseded. What you also had was that some of the old rules were no longer quite appropriate. There should be now an adaptation of the RISEX rules. Ten years have passed, and people are starting to break their own rules because they're no longer appropriate. We had a student in 2014 who looked at that. Um, and what also happened, and that's a very delicate political topic, but apparently the local users association where local RISEX members could be, could, were represented and could actually manage the RISEX had been taken over by other forces, by people who come from other associations um, and who were making political careers. And associated with that is a very positive and very negative things. A very positive thing associated with it is that people had gained in terms of social development. People had gained houses, fridges, very importantly, bolsas for their children, and a new generation of much more educated people were there 15 years later. And I was really amazed and happy to see that the children of fishers who were mostly illiterate now had right to enter university. That, that was amazing. What it did for the RISEX was also amazing, but not good. Um, the RISEX had changed, has changed, and we had two discussions about this already in, 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 in Braganza at the UFPA. So I got, and, and we had the big workshop. Um, the RISEX had changed in the local perception from a vehicle to protect the local environment that people's incomes depend on, to a vehicle to obtain inputs from the state. So the Movimento Sin Terra helped with houses, the Bolsas helped with education, there were all sorts of other inputs, boats at one point to be got. So the RISEX became a vehicle to get all these necessary parts of development. But what it did is destroy the social energy for environmental protection. That is no longer what people considered to be the rationale behind the RISEX. And that's the tragic part of it, that it was overwhelmed by things that could have been done outside the RISEX. Um, so that today when you ask people whether the RISEX is functioning and they say no, they mean you can't get a house anymore. They don't mean it's not protecting the mangroves. It's even been forgotten that that's the intention. And the question is um, whether that would have been avoidable. 
Um, some things might have been avoidable. Governance has become top-down again. It could be more adaptive. Rules could be adaptive. Um, local rights for, and to the mangroves are being undermined by political decisions as if there were no resacts. Um, the association with the, um, with the uh, social development inputs is another matter to discuss. Um, and maybe we'll leave that for the discussion. I'd very much go into that, uh, very much like to go into that with you. Um, so what we have now in dynamics, we have the old leaders of the RISEX that are now marginal in the RISEX. They're not even allowed to be leaders anymore because they're not so highly educated. They're the older fishermen. They're kept out. Politicians have taken over. The social support programs have shifted the rationale and the RISEX has lost the social energy for conservation. So we here, I get back to my theme, we have a case of where social energy has been effectively channeled or kindled um, and then undermined over a period of 15 years. Um, and uh, the question is, could you have done this or can one do social development with conservation in a way that where social development does not overwhelm the conservation impetus. And uh, we had a discussion at the UFPA where some rainforest examples seem to indicate that it's possible, but they're under, under, under different conditions. So yeah, that's um, what I want to say on this now, and I hope we discuss it. Um, and. Uh, if anybody wants to say anything on this case example or ask, otherwise I go to the third one and release you from just listening. No? Yeah? At the end, okay. Then I talk to you on the third case, Indonesia. Uh, when Madame was finished, the governments did not want to fund any more cooperation. We'd had 10 years, they weren't funding collaboration with Brazil. Very bad. They were funding cooperation with Indonesia and we had colleagues working there already and we had a 12-year period working in various regions of Indonesia but I will talk about this one where we were the whole time which is an island archipelago, coral reef archipelago of about 100 islands of which about 54 are inhabited. And it's, um, Indonesia has 17,000 islands of which are five big ones. And one of the big ones is South Sulawesi. And this island archipelago, I don't know, this is very small, but South Sulawesi is this one form of a chicken. And the island archipelago is just off South Sulawesi, so uh, of one of the five big ones. Um, you have a reef fishery there, very diverse reef fishery, 22 different technologies. You have a falling catch per unit effort that people get less for their effort as time goes on. And the reef is degrading. Um, we have uh, peaks of, for different um, reef products uh, that uh, consecutive catch peaks where the system then um, uh, falls. So we have sea cucumber, grouper, ornamental coral, bamboo coral, where in each you get a peak of catch and then it collapses. And the whole system there is very much oriented towards foreign markets. So much so that local fishermen, and most of the people on these islands are fishers, they talk of seasons and holidays, and they don't mean Indonesian seasons and holidays, they mean Chinese holidays and uh, free days, because that's when the Chinese buy these products. So they are really driven in their activities by Chinese and other foreign markets. Some of the issues that are there, on the top left you have a desalinization plant that is falling into the sea from erosion, freshwater scarcity on the islands also because of um, intruding seas. You have, and that's quite important for this talk, you have a formal community-based marine management policy and some large projects that are supporting community-based marine protected areas. Um, in a context of a lot of illegal destructive fishing, you have that here in the middle, that's um, 
not a photo because it's so illegal, bomb fishing, but you also have fishing with poison, cyanide. You have what you know from here as well, patron client relations, and the islands are threatened by climate change implications, erosion, land loss, and here there's salt water uh, intrusion. And you have unsustainable reef use, construction with the reefs that are supposed to protect the islands, and the islands then erode some more. Okay, that's the context. And I want to go down to fishing dynamics and marine protected area or marine management dynamics here. Um, as I said, you have illegal fishing. The man in the middle is not only protecting himself from sun, but from being recognized because um, he's a bomb fisher, blast fisher, um, that, um, uh, that destroys the reef. And all this is ongoing in the context of attempts to have community-based management that avoids it. Um, it's not really very well working. The... Um, uh, let me just say this before you look at the screen. Um, we did a long-term research, research of government and foreign project attempts to have organized participatory management to avoid bomb fishing, blast fishing, and that was not really working. It continued in parallel um, in the wider region. And so that was at first a very negative outcome. We did a lot of field work um, going around for two, three weeks at a time with large student groups, anthropologists who stayed on different islands or on boats. And we found out a parallel system of marine management that local people had come up with themselves. And this is on islands that had not much marine traditions. There were a lot of migrants there and um, also different ethnicities um, that had migrated there. This group of islands had been closed for a long period because of military matters and then reopened. So it's not the Indonesian classical example of marine traditions, but you did have marine informal rules, and that's what I want to show you now. They had um, a number of rules to stop uh, different technologies disturbing each other, and I won't go into the details. They had informal zoning that people agreed to and kept to, and they had, and that's the topic of the rest of this case study, they had self-defined and locally protected zones around islands. They had areas where everybody, and we're talking about a hundred small islands, agreed that people on the island have a right to make the rules on how the sea around the island is to be used. So that's a sort of classical statement. Reefs and reef flats around the island are island territory. Other marine areas, you can do what you like, open to all, but island areas are ruled by the island. So that was um, actually something surprising 10 years ago and um, new. We had a PhD student on it who looked at it in detail and I also took part in three or four two-week excursions to talk to people about it. So we called this self-organized island exclusion zones. Um, and they were characterized by each island had their own rules, so they were different by island. They emerged without any central coordination. There was nobody saying what the rule had to be. It was locally determined. And they are, were also not linked to any formal laws or government institutes, ministries, whatever. They were just island rules. So, so here are just some of the rules. I've taken out the names because in Indonesia you don't want to always spread the island name for something like that. But in one island, only islanders could use traps, particular traps and fish. In another island... They opened things to everybody who didn't use bombs or, or poison to fish. In another island, they just kept the corals for the, for the islanders. And all this had a logic in the technologies they were using. Um, so, and there, so you see there were different, different rules. What they had in common was that the local social energy protected the island reef areas. So the natural environment that the islanders depended on from what they considered outside harm. That was the sort of common denominator. Um, 
and the IEZ, the island exclusion zones, they had some very clear strength, local ownership and responsibility in the common sense of legitimacy, clear boundaries that people knew that could always show you where the island zone ends. And so that's a potential for management, for conservation that we also pointed out then. Um, here, this is an outcome of a PhD work by Rio Deswandi. He's an Indonesian PhD student that qualified with us at ZMT. And he or we argued together that these island exclusive zones have potential for regional marine governance. And what you see appearing there is island, protect, island exclusion zones. And you can see how they actually interlink into a wider area. So the idea being that you had a totally non-functioning formal system with rules that were imposed from the outside. Can you not take this? And the parallels to the RISEX are obvious. Can you not take these locally made rules and form them into something that then works at a certain level? So um, that was the idea. But of course, it's not always as easy as all that. Um, um, we do argue that islands have some sort of social energy that can form island social energy that can be used for ocean management if correctly recognized and facilitated. But of course you do need connections between people, between actors and institutions for that. And another PhD student that um, people here know, Philip Goris, who qualified also in 2015 or 16, did a study on social networks in island governance to show us, well, how are people actually communicating between those islands and between different governance institutions. And what you see here in the next one is a representation of social networks. You have different types of actors here. The red is government, the yellow is civil society, and I think the blue is resource users. Quite important, that's the fishers that communicate. What you see here and on the next one is actually, you see it better on the next one, the same color distribution. It's just a little bit of a different definition. What you see here is you have a lot of top-down connections and you have very little across. This level here is the communities, the villages, the local level. You have very, very little across. So if we're saying they need to collaborate in ocean governance that links locally made rules. There's a lot of work to do to actually connect actors horizontally so they can manage collaboratively. It can't just happen out of the local rules. There's more work to be done. And there's an article in preparation on that. Um, yeah, so latent pot potential for social energy in Indonesia. It needs to be facilitated still. Um, but a clear case where there is island-level social energy that can have a positive function for ocean governance. And I've talked to people in the South Pacific and there are similar things there. So that's a topic for wider ocean governance. And I think that was my three case studies, wake up. <laughs> and just some concluding thoughts for on this. Dependence on nature mobilizes people to protect it the nature they depend on for their own sustainable use. I think that came out of all three case studies in various ways. Um, I've tried to look at the case studies in terms of what facilitated and what destroyed social energy. So you have here the green things are what facilitated and the blue things are what destroyed. It may be a bit too, it's just a start of trying to develop a framework. Uh, it's clear outside support they had it in Brazil and in Belize. It facilitated access to markets, actually facilitated in Belize, and was very destructive in Indonesia. Different types of markets with different types of driving forces. Empowerment of ecosystem user populations, both in Brazil and Belize, the fact that things were possible and government changed to enable people was a very positive force. In Indonesia, we had only one example of where local island community rules were integrated into the big foreign project and it worked better. But that was just for one, one island. Um, 
and uh, at the local level, territoriality is there and helps, and we have that everywhere. The Tiradores de Caranguejo want to protect their mangroves and the uh, the local forest uh, dwellers in Belize want to manage their area, their national park. It's the same story. Ecosystem dependence helps. Now in Brazil, there's the question, are people now less dependent on the mangroves? And is that why they don't see that connection anymore? Or is it the external um, assistance with all the social development inputs that does that? Yeah, so replacement of ecosystem services for local population. Maybe that happened in Pará to some extent, but that's an open question. Yeah, so, ah, yeah. I found a literature, and that's one that gives hope. I think also, particularly in the Brazilian situation, as it is right now politically, um, Albert Hirschmann, in the, he was already senior in the 1980s, he examined over 50 small-scale grassroots projects in Latin America and looked at social energy. And he, he looked at failed ones and successful ones. And some of the conclusions he came, came up with, it's a very nice little book, was that social energy uh, rose, was born out of aggression, in many cases, either aggression from nature, some disaster, some natural disaster, from the state or from society. So the crisis. We already know that now. Um, the question is, do you always need a crisis? Um, he also found that even failed collective action, where social energy has somehow gone, like in the case of uh, the Rizeks in Pará, um, it remains with people within a lifetime and can be refueled. It isn't lost. And that's over 50 projects. So I think it's a sort of hopeful spark in terms of what might happen from these positive experiences still. It can be activated from a previous outbreak, uh, he calls it, outbreak of positive social energy. So it remains in store. So I quite like that as um, something which might help. Um, yeah. So, in the Anthropocene that I'm sure you've all discussed here at length, um, we have a great responsibility to manage towards a good Anthropocene, one where humans handle their collective power in ways that foster well-being as nested within human nature. I mean, in the Anthropocene, we are the major drivers, so we must make that into something positive. And... Um, Self-organization, that social energy, is a big part of that. And I would argue, and much of the literature, that it's essential for sustainable human nature relations to understand what drives people, what motivates them, and how one maintains that. So social energy for successful, not only local self-organization. I think this goes for... Uh, national networks of networks as well. Um, so, social energy in the Anthropocene um, may be a field for study, and if you have anything uh, you would like to present on this, you might want to submit an abstract to a forthcoming session that some of us here present, including Leopoldo Gerhardinger, are organizing at the Ocean, what's it called? Future Ocean Conference, which is of the IMBA Global Project for Marine Biodiversity, in, that uh, is actually a network of scientists that is growing, where there are lots of possibilities also for uh, um, for scientists that are not yet members. So, if you want to have present anything in the near future on topics related to this, please submit an abstract. And, I think I've said it now. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much for this excellent and inspiring talk here about... Uh, Social energy as a focus of your of your talk. I think it was uh, really interesting to 
uh, hearing about these different case studies that have been made by, by the Institute or by, by your section there. So I would like to start maybe with some comments only in order to, to start the discussion, then afterwards we can open to general questions. Uh, maybe I would first like to, uh, or one of the points I would like to have more, more ideas. You talked about the Office for Knowledge Exchange. I wonder if this uh, sounded very interesting, I think, uh, because it's one of the main problems between science and society, how we transmit knowledge to society and how this could influence um, society and political processes. So maybe you could talk a little more about it. What is this, uh, what are the addressees, the principal addressees of this? Uh, I, I don't know if you would like first to, uh, to hear my comments and then giving a general or you, you can also already Whatever you want to. Quickly say okay. something, because yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm at the Office for Knowledge Exchange is one of the groups of our institute. Yeah. I collaborate with them. So I can only say very generally that they work with major groups, the public sector, industry, and also ecosystem users. And they have from this year to raise their own funds, so we are hoping they'll manage that. But it's just our realization that we want, don't want science to stay on the shelf, and scientists are sometimes just not able to do all that by themselves, especially the translation into simpler languages. So the Office for Knowledge Exchange helps with that. Something we do is write policy briefs. They help with that and every study in our institute is now expected to produce a policy brief, which is just a page, up to four pages, one or two pages of directed conclusions at decision makers. And they could be local people or they could be national governments or international bodies, whatever. One has to identify one's audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, because this is a, uh, also a concern in our project so that we want to, to think about how to communicate with, with society in general. Uh, well, then I will uh, talk a little bit about your more theoretical topics and I will take the opportunity. There is one of our listeners or spectators on the internet he had a question about social energy uh, and the theoretical definition. So if you could talk a little bit more about that. But I would like to make some uh, additional comment on that because there are also some more uh, related concepts like social capital, for instance. And you talked about social networks. Also, you presented this as a... Uh, so I would like to know to which... Uh, what's the, the the particularity of social energy, or to which to which way it's linked also to this concept that might be at least for me more more uh, known and more common to talk about social capital? And I think uh, because it's based also there are some similarities definitely. So also the relational aspect is very important. You talked about this, the importance of the social tissue, uh, the, the, the the relations as of. As a, as a source of, of political activity, involvement. And maybe you could talk a little more about the aspect of conflicts. It, it came up in, in, in some of your uh, case studies and uh, to, because it seems on the one hand, some of your presentations as to Belize, it seems something more based on a more uh, constructive and cooperative way of coming to a uh, to, a sol to solutions based on collaboration between the, the local people and the associations that are involved in this process. But very often you have kind of external uh, conflicts and menaces, threats of the local people. I remember we had last week here uh, a discussion about Paranapiacaba, where we have a next, uh, the creation of a uh, of logistic center in an environmental vulnerable region and uh, that is threatening the local communities and are trying to organize themselves in order to to confront this and trying to work with the public sector but the public sector is very much related to these economic interests it seems so uh, there is very strong conflicts involved so I would like to know how the concept of social energy is related to to conflicts and to and 
to, to which extent this, this comes up in, in the, the, um, the, the examples or the cases that you have, that had, you have studied. And maybe as I'm more uh, related to urban issues, so do you think there are some differences? Because we have very often to, to handle with uh, problems where we have industrial economic interests involved very strongly. That are, it's also the case in Europe. In, in Europe but, uh, in terms of organizations, the cooperation with the political level. So it's, it, it is maybe you could also, uh, it's also in some, some men you mentioned some aspects of the influence of local actors of, let's say the municipality, the state actors that the national, the national level, the national government. So um, to which extent the state could be a positive agent to support local development processes and to, uh, because sometimes it seems you, you mentioned one one example where uh, the Brazilian example especially where you, you it, it seemed that um, what we ever uh, saw very much as a positive development in Brazil so this all this the more active state providing social uh, benefits for society uh, social services and so on, and maybe other uh, uh, positive aspects, it seemed that had a negative influence on social energy, as you said. So in the case that, that uh, these, uh, that the expectation of the local people are more directed now to the state, what the state, what could the state bring, uh, or, or what benefits he will provide for the local population, and so they are it seems that they are more, the expectations are higher uh, to, to access these possible resources from the state and there is less interest in, in social cooperation, in a more collective approach, uh, community approach. So it is to a certain way destroying social capital or it's destroying, uh, diminishing social energy. It seems something very... Uh, uh, disturbing for our, from our point of view, when we because we had very much hope that the state could be a positive change agent also in these kind of processes. So that's, I think, uh, basically, question. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot of questions. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, it was one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, social energy and social capital. Well, personally, the social capital term to me was always too. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a stable state where social energy talks about dynamics. There, there are lots of um, overlaps um, in, in, in terms of the kind of things one looks at, but basically energy is about change processes. It is a process and social capital uh, provides, provides these snapshots and I think it has an unfortunate association, the sort of term of capital across the social, economic and natural realm, um, I think it, it just falls short of what you can do and, and the term social energy uh, attempts to go a step further and look at dynamics. Um, saying that, and uh, the, the, the listener who wants a more theoretical definition, I've given what I have of that at the moment. Um, it's just a, this is just a talk I've come up with trying to look back at a lot of work that I've personally been involved with. And so that's why I've cited things from system theory, from psychology, even from economics, but that all have to do with an actual dynamics that is occurring. And, and, and that's the interesting thing, and how one measures that and whether it can be measured across, uh, one needs to look at that. But I think it's indubitably there, and it's been identified often enough in these various literatures across the social sciences and also into system sciences. And of course, you have the self-organization theme also in ecology. So um, there are lots of options to actually use it in terms of interacting, uh, self-organizing, living beings, be they human or non-human. So I think there's lots of potential, and that's how far I've gone on, on the theory, on the theoretical framework. Yeah, conflicts and social energy. Um, when you were talking, I thought, yeah, conflicts have acted as a spark, as a kind of external aggression, which led 
uh, and my focus has been ecosystem users, local people who in some way live off the ecosystems one also wants to protect. So conflicts have sparked um, self-organization against something that's perceived as an external aggressor or threat. Um, and they've also acted as an obstacle, of course, conflicts. Um, you've mentioned conflicts that uh, with uh, between objectives of government agencies and local people or conflicts between very heterogeneous local communities, inside very heterogeneous local communities. So conflicts are not, uh, have, do not have a uniform function. They have to be examined uh, contextually. And you mentioned examples where there were conflicts between the objectives of local actors and government public authorities at different levels. They can also overlap. That always has to be analyzed in, in a particular context, I think. Urban issues and social energy. Um, well, one of the encounters with social energy that really mesmerized me was in the, um, in the slums of Bogota, where self-organization by night to invade local territories to very quickly put up homemade solutions, a sort of a standard make ready-made house was there and so I mean that, that that's definitely I didn't analyze that here that was my master's thesis and uh, but I think the question arises there very much and urban movements are probably often stronger they have more people there's a lot more potential there uh, yeah and I mean you have it of course on the in the digital world as well we know how it moves positively and negatively so, yeah, I think definitely it would be a relevant topic. Mm. Can the state be a positive agent for local development? You were referring to. Um, I, I, I took very great care not to say that this local development was bad. It wasn't bad. It was good that people now have houses and are more educated. And um, that was all. No one could deny that and wants to deny it. It was the way the institutions for conservation were linked to public support, public benefits. It was the overlapping, the, the, the associating this with the Resex. That if that had been done separately, it, it might have worked very differently. Saying that, um, we have an example, somebody from Para was working on the coast and also in the rainforest. And they said that, we talked about social energy, and he said, uh, Professor Naldo Blanche in, in University of Para, that in the rainforest where people have fought and died to get resex, the social energy was strong enough not to succumb to assistentialismo. So that there people remember and they still have their connection to the forest and to what they want there, despite having gained all this support. But on the coast, it wasn't like that. On the coast, there was a new law, and Obama and CMPT said, if you have a problem, you can make a resex. So there was still social energy to do that. People wanted to do it and did it, and were happy that they could make their own rules. But that's not as strong as the original resex, the seringueros, that sort of movement. So I was really... Um, interested in that comment and he's done research there so it kind of leads us to further discussions I think yes yes thank you uh, I, I have some other question but I will uh, pass to to the audience now but uh, there's one question that comes from the same uh, listener or from from the internet so it's I didn't say his name Oscar Serac from Polytechnica USP there is a second question. So, uh, during all the time you have been doing research in coastal areas, have you, s have you seen specific cases of offshore exploration of oil and gas and their relations with the surrounding social energy? For your information, University of Sao Paulo is doing research for many projects and innovations at our research center for gas innovation related to that challenge. One of our main focus is the implementation of carbon capture and storage which we consider would be a great contribution for CO2 mitigation and an important social challenge. 
So, so the question is, have I seen any link to yeah. oil? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, there's somebody experience. who could talk a lot better on that here in the audience, but since <laughs> I'm being asked, uh, actually, I've worked on the coastal. The only kind of indirect link that I've seen and I can't say yet how it relates to the social energy. I think that's in progress. That's the Bayer de Babitonga, where it's one of the few or maybe the only cases where an oil spill and the fine that was imposed on the company responsible, the fine was used to help an, a series of projects and a process of self-organization that should or is leading to a protected area. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, I think, a, a very positive example of enabling from a crisis, from an external aggression, uh, an oil spill, to enable with the fine that the company paid a process of doing something better for human nature relations in that environment. And um, where we collaborate with that group, the Proba Bitonga project and um, an associated number of projects. And I think that's in, in progress. Um, that's, do you want, yeah. So I, we pass to. Thank you. Thank you, Marion, for the, the insightful uh, words. Um, well, my name is Leopoldo. I'm a postdoc at the Oceanographic Institute of Sao Paulo here at USP. And my question relates to, uh, to that one also. Perhaps uh, it will pave the way so we can uh, answer the, 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 the person from the Internet. So uh, uh, you mentioned interesting cases of how social energy changes year by year or in a 10-year period. So it is... Uh, the, 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 frame, the framing of the energy that uh, drives the, the energy towards some good or bad uh, outcome uh, changes a lot. And that's, that's real life. That's real policy life. That's what policymakers face all the time. So I'm trying to uh, understand how uh, on a methodological approach, on the socio-psychological system analysis, uh, uh, what ideas or what methodologies have you come across that can help research action groups to deal with these dynamics on real life? Of course, it's uh, one thing to do empirical analysis over long-term periods of time, uh, questionnaire-based, informant, key informant-based, focal groups, and so forth, and then to feedback on uh, in continual engagement model of research action. Uh, what methods do, do, do you come across that can help these teams uh, to, to work, reshuffle this energy towards some uh, desired goal? And connecting this issue of methodological issue to uh, uh, the national level of marine spatial planning. How, how do we uh, uh, transform the way that Brazil does ocean governance? That's a coming to the more regional level of social energy. So we currently operate in a very fragmented sectorial-based planning approach where oil, gas, tourism, aquaculture, fishery, biodiversity doesn't talk to each other. So this is the current regime. Uh, so the idea in social energy, and we've worked on this issue on a recent paper that you co-authored, it's to lower, lower the resilience of the dominant regime so a more ecosystem-based, uh, integrated regime can, can come up. So we have now uh, a four-year collaboration starting uh, to do action research in Brasilia City with a different setting, political setting. So, <laughs> so what ideas, what kind of methodologies, what can we do in a research action in a city that is uh, kindly... Um, operating in these new political um, conditions, what what can you give us ideas yeah. in this direction? Yeah, you've um, entered the very important theme of methods, and yes, one needs to get away from this sort of impressionistic how it was and how it developed and why to something that can be applied now and look into the future, and. Um, Network analysis, as you know, we are engaging with that, and I'm not saying that's the only method. There is a great scarcity in social ecological analysis and methods, 
and network analysis, social network analysis and social ecological network analysis are fields that are, it's a field that is both quantitative, but that can also be used in very qualitative ways, participatory ways. And its important potential is, I think, in looking at things over time, in uh, going beyond what network analysis has done, where you present a network, as I did there, at one point in time, and you look at it over time. We have one PhD student trying to do that for the Babitonga case, but it's early days yet. But that is, I think, um, one way of approaching it methodologically. And when you talk about Brasilia, the new political climate, and what can one do in terms of mounting a research project that looks at the dynamics of collaboration, of action groups within there, um, I very much like the analysis next year. There is a conference in Lüneburg in February that takes up ideas by Donella Meadows on points of leverage in a system. And a point of leverage is identified as a point in a system where a defined sort of intervention uh, that is feasible, not too difficult, not too hard, not too costly, has the maximum desired transformative impact. And if you look at systems, also at networks at systems, you, you can go and attempt those things. And um, we are preparing a paper trying to do that for a case in Bangladesh, and we present that next February. Um, that, that's another way, sort of integrated system analysis with a very clear focus on leverage points within systems. And there's a very nice definition of what a good leverage point is. That would be too far to go into here. So, yeah, at the moment I can say systems analysis in various ways, their methods of quantitative and qualitative, and also system analysis. But that can't be all. Um, Agent-based analysis is also a good point where you define, and especially in terms of the social agent, you understand and let agents define their roles in the system and you can sort of um, show that as a model. We have models, for example, that are used in environmental education and that can model different behaviors and their implications. And those can be action research tools when they're used with different groups. They might lead to uh, changes in people's views and opinions and perceptions that change behavior. That's also something one can explore. And we have a modeler that specify, specifically concentrates on multi-agent modeling where natural and social actors interactions are uh, combined. It requires a lot of data. You usually need at least two full-time researchers to do that. But, yeah, NetMaps is the participatory way of um, network analysis, which is kind of fast, can be used with interviews or with different groups, and which is very good at modeling people's perceptions of an issue, an interaction, a governance system. And um, you can never claim it reflects reality, but then people's actions are according to what they perceive and not according to some reality that we might never catch. No. And we are actually, you probably know, one of our PhD students, Eike Holzkemper, is now developing ways of combining and even using quantitatively net map analysis. I think you know about that. No? <laughs> yes, yeah, there is first and the two. Please, and um, present yourself first. Okay. Uh, I am Luciana Araujo. I'm working as a researcher here in the Institute, Environmental and Energy Institute here with Christina Adams. She's here with us too. And uh, thank you for your talk. I have uh, one question that uh, was sent by a colleague, Alice Moraes. She's with us online. And I would like to, after the question, make a comment on this issue of uh, the role of the state and social policies. Well, uh, her, uh, her question is she's, she would like to hear you uh, about the relation 
between social energy and community self-organization. I would add uh, two more things in her question. Um, uh, I would uh, ask you if uh, this concept, uh, social energy, it is a, uh, a concept to uh, able to um, uh, make self-organization uh, operational thing to to be analyzed. This is one question uh, added to Alice's question. And the other thing is, when we think about um, uh, socio-ecological resilience at the community level, uh, would it this concept work in the same way as social energy? Why uh, I'm thinking about that? Because if we think about uh, the elements that nurture uh, socio-ecological resilience, would it be similar to what make uh, social energy high or good or positive? This is uh, the question that I, I, I just uh, added some things on Alice's question. The other thing is about uh, the role of the state. Uh, I don't know if I am able to, to develop my idea on, uh, in English, but I will try. Um, when we think about uh, social policies in the last 14 years, uh, and we are living a, a, a uh, period, uh, a time, a very difficult time, because we're losing all that was developed in this 14 years. And when we go to the communities, I think everybody here has experience on that, we see lots of changes uh, in, in this, um, in the way people uh, see the role of the state the access to education, to universities, and I, uh, my experiences tell me um, that uh, the young leaders, and when I say young, I am talking about people of 30 to 40 years, um, they have another uh, opinion about the state. They say that the social policies and all the resources that they can assess are very important to take them near to knowledge, to make them more autonomous in many ways, including in economic ways. And this is very important uh, to make them able to act as leaders, as people that can change things. The other point at, is that this, this contest put these people, um, um, they are able to, to, how do I say that? To take opportunities, economic opportunities that their fathers couldn't. Their fathers, in, in, in my study areas, their fathers and grandparents were fishing, and planting, and these 30 and 40 years people, they are, they are doing that, but they are doing other things. And this, uh, uh, in their point of view, this makes them more autonomous. This is something that emancipates these people. So I, I would like to hear, because when you talked about this, this situation in Pará, I don't know that reality, okay? Uh, I, I said, well, but can we, can, if, if social energy is a dynamic concept, uh, how could we think about all these changes that came from the state, from this, this uh, uh, Partido dos Trabalhadores government that brought all this, this, these resources to this area, how is this uh, um, acting in the system, thinking dynamically? Because, you know, things are changing, 
and and it's it's not a, 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 a one package that changes. You know, things are changing in different levels, in different times. So I would like you to to comment on that. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that question. I think I'll start with that one. Um, yes, I've, I've I've taken great care to say that those social policies have good effects. And I think you're quite right to draw attention to the question of what did they do at an overall system level, because not everything is about mangrove conservation. Uh, and uh, um, you, you know much better than I whether and how new leaders have been formed. And yes, new economic opportunities are being taken there in Para. And uh, my argument just simply didn't reach that level. My, I was talking about sustainable human nature relations. And my argument is that the association of these social policies that are of extremely high value, and uh, I'm very afraid of what might happen if they're reverted, but they, might, they, they probably will have had effects and hopefully that add to the, uh, to the generation of positive social energy for, for a better future in, a, in, a, in an even wide, more widely defined way. Um, so my, my argument was that associating in the same institution, Reserva Estativista, these policies, it killed the conservation impulse that people had, which is the social energy for protecting the mangroves that are locally, that feed the fishing families and feed the crab collecting families. It was simply too big to get a house, to get a bolsa, to get um, a fridge and a boat was much bigger than we protect our own environment. So it changed the rationale for that resex. This is the only argument. It's about what, if it had been outside, somewhere else, another ministry, another movement, another project, and left the resex alone, something very different might have happened. It's just about associating it, not about doing it or not doing it. And as I said, in the rainforest and interior, an old resex had the same thing. A colleague studied it and he said, yes, it was a problem, but they're still there. They remember fighting for their environment, for their forest, that's still there. But on the coast, there are people, a lot of migrants, a lot of people from Serra, from the interior. They said if they made a resex because there were a few problems with the mangrove. Now they could get houses, so the resex lost its initial aim and gain the social benefits. The benefits wasn't wrong. The way they were introduced was the problem, amongst some other. Yeah. May um, I try the, just... Uh, was there something finish? else? The resilience. You, you asked about social ecological resilience and how it can be strengthened. And um, I would just want to say on this one that social ecological resilience is not always something that needs to be strengthened. It also can need to be broken. In Indonesia, we have exploitative regimes that is really heavily um, with bomb fishing and poison fishing, and there's a new ecological regime that is a completely destroyed, different ecosystem from the coral reefs. That's now resilient, and you need to manage the resilience by breaking it. Leo also talked about breaking resilience, you have to manage it, not always strengthen it, to see what's there. There was an extra question. Self-organization and social energy. Uh, I th no, was it? The At the community level. Yeah, I would say in my current working definition, local self-organization is a form of social energy, but it can exist at multiple levels. And self-organization is the systemic expression that is used for social energy. You have self-organization also uh, in ecosystems of uh, living non-human entities. So it's, it's a very related concept. But uh, social energy relates to the social realm, to working with people, and that's how I've sort of focused down on it. 
So I would say self-organization is a systemic umbrella term. No, just, just to add a little bit of that question regarding the policies, I'm Deborah. <laughs> I've been working with Hezex at Pará, but not Caeteta Pirassu. Ah. So I, I just think it's important to add, add this question about the social policies in, and the relation with the Hezex uh, implementation. I, I guess it's important to put more emphasis on Casas do Incra. I guess you for sure heard about this. The policy of, because when people, um, when they create his ex, his ex starts to be part of uh, the agrarian reform national policy. So they are able to have some credits and one of them are the housing credits. Mm -hmm. So the big problem in Pará, and I think it's not just in Caetata Perasu, but in all of yeah. those his ex, regards this policy specifically, because there are many cases of corruption when they started to implement these houses, the credits that they are being part of this policy. So this specific policy is important to discuss. I guess just not to having this idea that there is a trade-off between social development and social energy, maybe. Um, just to, ha to put more like, uh, to explain more this policy. Not to yeah. develop yeah. social development. I mean, I don't general. think you can throw out the baby with the bathwater and say social development uh, must not be there with conservation. The RISEX were globally a um, role model for not throwing people out of protected areas and saying yes. nature must be protected and you out and you can't do all this. And so it was a real progress to say uh, integrate traditional populations into national development as an aim for the RISEX, that was fantastic. But if it is associated with huge external inputs, that's different from making rules that allow people to use nature without destroying it. The, the huge external inputs were overwhelmed it, no? And the, the Casas to Inkla, that was the, the, people all talk about the houses. There were some other things as well, the bolsas helped and so on but it was just not to be in that, to all be, all be made in an integrated package. That was the problem, no? yeah. a problem. I we'll feel like talk that's more. an interesting framework when you integrate public policies with environmental conservation. I guess the framework of his ex, including public policy like Bolsa Verde or any other types, like credits of agrarian reform are quite interesting, but yeah. this is my... Point of view. <laughs> <them all. Okay. laughs> there is the, the, the colleague in the yellow shirt here. Oh, uh, he was first already. Okay. He was already. <laughs> okay, Grazie. please. Meu nome é Rafael Humus, eu sou consultor do Ministério do Meio Ambiente no projeto Jeff Mar, né, na região costeira do sul. Colaboro com o, o CG Commons da Unicamp, é, coordenado pela Cristiana Seixas. E localmente, aqui na região oeste da, da Grande São Paulo, eu facilito uma rede de proprietários de áreas naturais. Então, a minha, a minha questão vem um pouco desse mundo da prática e um pouco da pesquisa. né? E é sobre a interação entre ligações verticais e horizontais nesses programas. né? É, a falta, a insuficiência, a ausência de ligações horizontais, né? ela é frequentemente mencionada como um problema, apareceu aqui, apareceu nos projetos que eu estudo, estudei na Amazônia. É, só que essas pessoas elas estão convivendo ali ao longo de gerações, no mesmo espaço, e colaboram entre si. E, ou seja, as ligações horizontais elas estão lá. Né? Elas estão lá. E, especialmente, elas, é, em um trabalho comparativo que a gente fez lá no CG Commons, entre diversas iniciativas de, de gestão de recursos naturais em áreas protegidas, a gente notou que é, onde essas ligações é, estão condicionadas é, por uso informal, é, por exemplo, caça, e até proibido, né, como a caça, ou como é, o uso, a gestão e as relações que se estabelecem em, em torno de uma floresta sagrada, né, como que a parte meio marginalizada da gestão. Né, essas ligações mais horizontais aparecem e aparece um padrão de rede muito mais distribuído do que 
é, por exemplo, os padrões que eu observei nos meus projetos na Amazônia, né, que são é, redes com um diâmetro muito grande e com uma predominância das ligações verticais. Né. Então, diante disso, é, a minha pergunta é, será que a gente está procurando as ligações horizontais do jeito certo? <risos> né, metodológica. É, será que o modo como a gente está construindo as ligações verticais, porque o nosso papel como pesquisadores, consultores, ele é, é como nó, é, nó de uma ligação vertical né, nesses, nesses sítios, será que o modo como a gente está promovendo essas ligações horizontais não está é, destruindo e prejudicando ou impedindo a conexão dessas redes verticais com as horizontais? E a terceira e última seria... Se Cabe mais entendi. uma? Essa, não sei se entendi essa última. Ah, é assim, é, será que o modo como estamos é, promovendo as ligações horizontais, como gestores, como pesquisadores, né, como participantes dessas ligações horizontais... Será horizontais que... é assim. Des Desculpa, então... é assim. Isso, tá. eu estou falando que nós participamos das ligações verticais. Tá. É. E tô... Ah, desculpa. Eu vou deixar minha mão quieta. Eu vou só falar. Então, a minha pergunta é, é será que o jeito como a gente está participando e promovendo essas ligações verticais não está prejudicando a nossa relação com as ligações horizontais? E aí a terceira e última seria, existe um, um nível comunitário né, da localidade, existe um nível que ainda congrega usuários de recursos, que seria um nível, um nível supracomunitário, mas ainda é, conectando usuários. Por exemplo, é, as diversas comunidades e associações comunitárias que compõem a associação mãe de uma reserva. Sim, né? existe, claro. E aí eu coloco uma hipótese. Será que esse, esse nível supracomunitário, mas congregando ainda usuários... Né, e, portanto, caracterizando ligações entre pares, horizontais, não é um espaço é, privilegiado e interessante para trabalhar essas ligações horizontais? Sim. Eu concordo completamente com essa última. Até descobrimos que nessas reserves costeiras no Pará, que não tem atividade, quase nada, o nível da inteira reserva, mas nos polos, um polo é, é, um, entre seis e oito comunidades, lá ainda existe atividade. É o único espaço onde ainda se, se mantém essa conexão com a proteção da natureza na qual depende o povo local. Um, yes. As outras perguntas... Se já, eu vou, uh, vou falar em inglês, talvez. You asked uh, whether we need to discover other networks, and I completely agree. The hunting network that you, that you manage, mentioned is maybe the relevant network to build on, and a network is always related to something, so one needs to look at what are other types of connections, and I showed the Indonesian example, and that was how people collaborate on marine governance issues. So maybe they collaborate on something quite different, between the islands. In this case, I doubt it, because it's migrants and they have different languages and all sorts between the islands. But in, in the Brazilian case, you might be a lot, uh, the, the, the information might be a lot different. So yeah, it depends. We need to look at other types of networks and see how you could maybe build on per, uh, rela kinship networks or something to do with schooling, education. One needs to be creative there, I agreed. Um, and I don't know, I can't answer the question about whether you're destroying one kind of link by collaborating with another because I don't know enough about what you do. Um, you're asking me what in your practice, whether you're destroying horizontal links by emphasizing vertical links. Posso dar um exemplo? É, quando chega um recurso, especialmente recurso volumoso, para uma associação comunitária, quando ela existe, porque às vezes ela não existe e é criada às pressas para absorver esse recurso. Sim. Né? Ou quando esse dinheiro chega e é colocado na mão de dos poucos líderes e às vezes líderes ah, é. não capacitados, uhum. isso erode os laços de cooperação social ah, que já que já estavam, é, causa brigas entre famílias, então... É, 
causa yeah, uma so estrutura. Então, você cria novas networks, você está dizendo, porque há um external input. Yeah, that's when I started talking about social energy, as I've explicitly said that uh, I'm talking about cases where this isn't the case, where external inputs haven't created a project and activity that immediately ceases when the project finishes. That's why I mentioned the Belize example, because this is rare. There's a great danger that we create things that only are maintained because of external inputs, and that's really the wrong way to go about it. It's an argument to research what there is, not to create a new institution and a new network, but work with what there is operating <coughs> already. Yeah. Mm. Anybody else? No? Okay. <laughs> eh. Bom, já que o Rafael começou, vou falar em português também. <risos> é, é, meu nome é Henrique, é, eu trabalho em uma organização não governamental, se chama Instituto Linha d'Água. É, a gente atua apoiando projetos na, nas, nas comunidades, nas associações. Então, eu queria eu me reconheço muito na pergunta do Rafael aí sobre, né, porque eu vi numa das é, dos slides das conclusões ali que essa relação com o incentivo externo, a, a, o suporte técnico, digamos assim, né, sempre gerou né, essa energia social, né, ela alimentou, né, estava no verde nesse lá, caso, como é nesse nesses caso. três casos aí, né. É, então até pensando nesses três casos, né, entender como foi essa interação entre esse apoio técnico de fora com a própria, que também é uma energia social, com a própria energia social que já existia ali. Né? Então, em que, em que medida é, que foram nivelados essas expectativas e, e que, de fato, a energia social local é quem pautou e, e, e construiu a real necessidade e não da, do projeto externo chegando hum. com a sua necessidade, a sua própria agenda. Né? Hum. Então, como que foi esse balanço Bom, se... entre essas duas, essas duas energias aí que existem. Né? Aí, é, uma outra coisa que eu gostaria de perguntar, você comentou da comunicação entre as ilhas. Né? Então, de quais seriam as ferramentas mesmo, né? porque a gente tem discutido bastante também essas ferramentas de interação. Então, hoje, aí indo para um conceito mais reduzido da... da da, da rede social, né? Mas falando dos WhatsApps e das, então como tem como as ferramentas que externalizam essas energias, como eles têm utilizado como nesses casos que você mostrou, como essa se dá essa dinâmica de comunicação frente às novas fronteiras tecnológicas que a gente tem visto potencializando essas energias sociais, né, que faz com que elas saiam do, do núcleo só comunitário ali e passem a engajar pessoas que antes nunca nem se relacionavam é. com esses territórios, muitas das vezes. né. É, bom, são essas duas questões. Aí. Obrigado. No caso da Indonésia, é, explicitamente foi incluído é, o, o contato a atores em múltiplos níveis, até, bom, até o nacional. Então, o doutorando que fez isso perguntava sobre interações. E interações não só diretamente, mas incluindo o mundo digital. Então, ele teve uma pergunta sobre interações pelo... Não, não era WhatsApp, mas esses meios digitais de, de comunicação. Então, nesse sentido, tivemos incluído. Um, tá, também tem opções de explicitamente estudar no, no meio digital, uh, mas você tem que ter acesso aos dados e a gente não entrou nesse campo, tem um outro grupo em Bremen lá que está fazendo, estamos em contato, é uma opção, mas nesse caso você se, se é, confirma, é, you would restrict yourself only to the digital world in that case, so, but there are ways of doing this. Um, Your other question was on Belize. How is the balance between the outside project, government forces, and the local community achieved? It, it's a very specific case, but I would say sort of in general, the, we started out in a typical situation telling local people what they shouldn't do, and they said, don't 
we need to kill the bush, go away, we need to survive. But there were the options to discover how their objectives of uh, sustainable livelihood and the forest protection, the project we worked on was forest planning and management, how they could be combined. And because they were local leader with the appropriate trust and connections, um, and we were there for a critical number of years so we could accompany the revision of the local forest management, the national forest management laws, it was possible to have a balance where these very different objectives were combinable into one direction, ecosystem-based uh, social project, including national park. It just um, were both objectives at a time, and it seems that it paid over the years. We just have to see whether it's still a local project or not. I hope to see that with the works next year. <laughs> Well, is there any other questions? If, if not, we are, it's past 12 o'clock, so I would like to thank you very much, first to Professor Marian for her very excellent talk and interesting talk. I had we have a very dynamic and interesting discussion. Uh, and we see that it's a kind of a very environment, a very complex environment, and we have to be very careful about any kind of interventions that, that are done. So we want to support certain processes at the same time. They might have some side effects that are not necessarily so uh, positive. And uh, so I think there is at least very much research necessary in order to understand these kind of, these different influences on these processes of of social self-organization of these kind of of developments. I would like to thank you, every, the audience, to, that you have been here, the audience in the on the on the website, and uh, well, so we can close this session. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Anymore, and thank uh, you. applause for for our uh, uh, talk. <laughs>